morning again. We're going to be in the book of Matthew, chapter 20, this morning. It is is such a nice thing to have that time of prayer where we can lift up those we're thinking of and those who are struggling and a good time to share praise. And, uh, you know, I can't help but think, really, what what is church meant to be? I know there are different kinds of churches. Some people think the church is where you come to worship God, that this is, and I think that's called liturgical, where they make everything about the service kind of like a a temple in a sense. And uh, I think uh, I fall more in the category of, right, you know, when we come together, wherever that may be, there the church is. And, uh, And what is the church? Church is the family of believers, where to help each other, lift each other's burdens, remind each other of the gospel, and uh, to sing praises to him together. So uh, it's good to be here, good to be here with you today, and, uh, and to know about your lives as well. I think, uh, you know, the fishbowl kind of maybe breaks some people out of their comfort zone, but hey, isn't that what it's about, right? Uh, we want to know, you know, or at least be thinking about each and every one of you in here. So if you don't have your name in there, uh, fill out your little tear off and put it in there. Someone last week said, put my name in the, uh, the fishbowl and then put that in, but they didn't put their name on it. <laughs> I don't know if I should just assume that was all of you and I'll just put them in there. But if you did put that in last week, just put it in again with your name. Um, we don't do general things in there. It's just specifically you. Uh, today, my sermon is called Freed Up to Follow, and uh, really it's the, uh, the miracle, the last miracle before Jesus enters into Jerusalem for the triumphant entry, which ushers in uh, the events that are going to lead to the last week of Jesus' life. He's going to have the Last Supper, and we're going to see the level of sacrifice our Lord and Savior is going to, uh, to endure on our behalf. So today we'll be looking at that miracle that Matthew documents just prior to the triumphant entry. And, uh, and we see this in Matthew chapter 20, 29 through 34. And I, I could relate in this uh, scripture, it's talking about two blind men who are healed. And uh, I don't know, for some reason, I think lately things have been getting real busy for me. And sometimes you get down and blue, don't you? Like you're, you're like, man, I, I need a break or I need a, uh, a reprieve from all that's going on. And, and because that stuff tends to hinder us. It tends to draw our attention away from really what matters. And I think as we think about these two blind men being healed of blindness, right? God has removed a major distraction in their ability to follow Christ. And I think we need that. We need to be lifted. We need to be healed. We need to be unhindered from the things that draw our attention away from Christ. And that's what we're going to see in the scripture today. And hopefully that's going to speak to you that there is hope in Christ. There is hope of refocusing your attention on what truly matters Um, even if that means enduring the hardships that you're going through right now. It says in verse 29, Matthew 20, As Jesus and the disciples left the town of Jericho, a large crowd followed behind. Two blind men were sitting beside the road. And when they heard that Jesus was coming that way, they began shouting, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Be quiet, the crowd yelled at them. But they only shouted louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when Jesus heard them, he stopped and called, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, they said, we want to see. Jesus felt sorry for them and touched their eyes. Instantly they could see. And then they followed him. There's our scripture for today. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Lord, uh, we come together today as a family of believers here in Dover Foxcroft, and I love being identified as someone who's been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, Lord. That is what makes me who I am, and uh, we're grateful that we can come together today in your name to look at your word so that we can begin to uh, allow the Spirit to change us, Lord. We want to be better. We want to be holy because you're holy, Lord. We want to be more like you because you are the great God who has uh, redeemed uh, mankind, Lord. And uh, we're thankful for that. We think of uh, uh, all, all that 
is going on today, Lord, in the hardships and the heartbreak, Lord, people can lose sight of you in that um, mist, Lord. So we do pray for clarity, clarity for each of us. Maybe we're in a valley right now and we don't even know it, Lord. So I do pray for clarity. Help me to preach the message, to be clear in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, last week we talked about the uh, parable of uh, the, uh, the employer who hired people throughout the day and paid them all the same wage, which was just a demonstration of uh, the generosity of God and how you're better off you know, leaning on that generosity instead of trying to do an even exchange with God. And, and I always hate, I have, sometimes I have object lessons and I forget to use them. And uh, just, you know, maybe this is a reminder for your message. And I thought uh, the reminder would be, you know, some of us think that the things that we do for the Lord, the sacrifices we make, you know, we're going to show up and God's going to give us our reward and it's going to be like this. Here you go, right? And uh, really that I thought that scripture was speaking to me about the fact that, you know, what's going to end up happening is we're going we're gonna to show up there and he's going to bring out our reward, recognizing the fact that, hey, what you did for me mattered in a huge way, right? When Peter says, well, what will I get for giving up everything I have? And, and Jesus says, you're going to get a hundredfold. And if we would recognize that, right, we're not, you know, when we sacrifice for the Lord, we're not getting a little, we're getting a lot, can we give up a little bit more for him? So that was my object lesson. Try to get you to remember the message. Sometimes those objects help me to remember, but uh, there it was. I didn't totally waste it. So, All right, if you have your scribe sheets, this is uh, the best way to follow along. And my main idea for today is uh, a healed soul makes greater room for Christ in your life. A healed soul makes greater room for Christ in your life. And there are many forms of healing, right? Here we're seeing two men who were blind, right? And, and obviously they're together, they're finding probably some comfort in being with someone that has the same ailment and, and they're, they have a hardship, right? We can't even imagine, right? I know there's no one here that's blind, but uh, to lose your sight must be traumatic. But as I think about it, as I think about the hardships that they're going through, I definitely think there are many forms of blindness among us, aren't they? We can lose our sight. We can lose our vision of what Christ should mean in our own lives. We get caught up in whatever it is that we're consumed with, and it becomes like blinders. And it draws us away from him. So that's my thought process as I was looking at the scripture today. These two blind men spoke to me. In my valley, in my hardship, am I rejoicing in the Lord? Am I finding him more present in my life? Or am I uh, lamenting? Am I groveling? Am I losing sight of uh, the, the treasure that we have in Christ? So that first point on the scribe sheet... Uh, really is pertaining to the first verse, right? Uh, the first couple verses there, Jesus and his disciples are headed to the town of Jericho. And uh, I think one of the, the great uh, elements here, uh, Jericho, here, so this is a large town about eight miles west of the Jordan. And uh, it's about 19 miles northeast from Jerusalem. This is where Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. Uh, and this is uh, near to the city the Israelites crossed uh, when they entered into the land of Canaan. So as you remember, when Jesus, uh, when Jesus, when God took the Israelites out of Egypt and brought them through the desert, they came into Israel, came into that promised land through uh, Jordan. It was the first city taken by Joshua, uh, and it was destroyed by the, the, uh, at the foundation, right? You remember the, uh, the amazing miracle of going around the city seven times, right, and, and blowing their trumpets and yelling, and the walls come collapsing down. And uh, here Jesus is going through this town and, and comes upon these two blind men. He's going to perform a miracle. And what does a miracle do, right? It definitely brings validity to his authority, to his power, and to his identity. Um, and, it's, and, it, and it seems like a right way in which to begin entering into Jerusalem. I had been, uh, I did kind of 
slide over the scripture in, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 through 19. If you're, if you're in your Bibles, you can look at that. Uh, this here, once again, Matthew is revealing the fact that Jesus uh, continued to tell his disciples what was about to happen. I think one of the important things that people need to realize is Jesus dying uh, on the cross was not, right, uh, a plan gone wrong. It wasn't an alternative outcome. It was literally why Jesus came. So throughout Matthew, Jesus uh, continued to tell the disciples and hint at the fact initially that, that he was going to die, but then he got very specific, starting in Matthew 16 and then uh, here in Matthew 20, talking about how uh, they would sentence him to die. He would be handed over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip, and crucified. But on the third day, uh, he will be raised from the dead. So Jesus was uh, filling them in and uh, giving them that insight that they needed, right, during that hard time of wondering, did God fail? But God did not fail, right? God was fully uh, implementing his plan. And and that is a joy that uh, we can see that uh, this wasn't an alternate plan. This was the plan. So that first point in your scribe sheet, as I think about the first couple verses there, uh, it's hard to follow Jesus when you can't see where he is. Really, think about it. These two blind men, they're sitting by the roadside, and they hear that Jesus is coming, and, you know, it's by, in their own minds, they're thinking by chance that uh, Jesus happened to be going by at that time. And I think uh, it's hard to follow Jesus when you can't see no matter what it is that's clouding your vision. Uh Oh, my battery's died. Maybe just take a moment. I hate to say it. I think I'm just too cheap to to change them on a regular basis. We should just ride it out until they die, right? (laughs) Did anyone time me? What do, you, what do you think, Andrew? Good time. All right. Ooh, that was pretty good. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> it's bound to happen. I hate to change them too often. Batteries are expensive these days, aren't they? Ooh, buy a 9 volt? Forget about it. All right. So uh, where was I? So it's hard to follow Jesus when you can't see where he is. And, you know, it's kind of mocking the blindness of these two men, but But that is what happens, I think, in our despair, in our hardships, uh, when we're heartbroken, when we're overwhelmed, uh, when we're busy. It's a form of blindness. And we forget the fact that we are redeemed people. We're the people of God to be living out our lives as his people. um, And we should have a certain attitude about that. We should have a certain air about us That shouldn't go away when things get dark or difficult. But let's face it, you know, that's where it's human nature. I think we tend to lose sight of uh, the Lord when we're going through hard times. But the beauty of that is uh, a healed soul makes greater room for Christ in your life. There's always an opportunity when you wake up thinking, man, why am I so miserable? And you begin to recognize the fact that I'm a Christian. I know the Lord. I know where I'm going. Why am I so blue? Why am I so down? Where is my mind? And that blindness, I think, can, can also, you know, it takes many forms. I think it can become a mental thing. If you focus on the wrong things, you begin to draw closer to those things. If what you think about more than anything is something other than the Lord, guess what? You've entered into a time of blindness, temporary blindness. And it's hard to follow Jesus when you can't see where he is. And I think that's the challenge we have today. Is something in your life consuming you? Is something in your life drawing all your attention, making you a negative person, making you, you know, an anxious person, someone who uh, thinks more about Uh, What could go wrong rather than what has gone right? (laughs) That's my dilemma, right? I I always think about what could go wrong. But that's that heart of thankfulness. Man, so many things have gone right. So in the hardships, we, uh, we lose our vision. But guess what? There's hope. And I think sometimes that makes us appreciate the Lord even more. 
good to walk through a valley once in a while. It, it puts things into perspective. And I think I shared with you way back, I remember once feeling really depressed in college, and I was just overwhelmed going to engineering school, right, and all these tests, and I was bumming something, I think. I think when CJ was born, I was a junior, and I was taking organic chemistry, and I was bumming that class. I, I, I think I got a D in it. And I was getting so depressed and, and really, you know, the depression was kind of taking root into my soul. And I remember driving, you know, it was one of those thoughts. I was driving through town and I had to stop and go, who cares? In the grand scheme of things, is this moment consuming to my soul? You know, is my life ruined if for somehow I have to take the class over? Or even if I have to change my major, or maybe I have to leave school, right? Is that the end of me? And it just put things in perspective. And I think that happens for us when we enter into that, that time of blindness, into that valley where things get dark. Hopefully it's a watershed moment where you go, in the grand scheme of things, you know what, it really doesn't add up uh, that I'm giving it that much attention. Here, the, these two blind men are going to experience some vision, but it, it takes a little effort there. And I think uh, the effort that they had in, is the second point of my scribe sheet. In the darkness, listen for the Savior. Here they are. They're blind. They had heard of Jesus. They understood his power, the potential there was if, if they happened to be in the midst of Jesus. And, and I suspect they were by the road. And when they heard a rumbling that Jesus is coming, they probably woke up, right? They got on their feet and they started listening a little bit better with their ears. And I'm, that's my encouragement to you today. In your valley, in your blindness, in the dark, listen for the Savior. Because he's in the wings and he's waiting for you to draw near to him. And I think it's good for us to uh, acknowledge the fact that we're going to go through those throughout our lives, right? You could probably think of many valleys that you've been in that you've come out of. And you came out of them because you were listening. And you were processing, how does this factor into all the things that, you know, should matter in my life? This idea that, you know, it's hard to follow when, uh, Jesus when we can't see where he is. Uh, I was thinking of all the ways in which we could get distracted. I, I thought of different verses. I know the one with Peter. Peter boasting about, you know, in, the, in, a, you know, in a state of mind where he could be boasting about all the privilege that he had. You know, Jesus uh, was revealing to him uh, some amazing things. And we know that thorn in his side was something that was not pleasant. It was an aversion. It created uh, a focus that was on Christ to draw her away from him. I think in that moment, you know, that thorn in his flesh was something that drew him away from the Lord to where that's all he wanted to talk about. Lord, fix this problem. I want this to go away. And Jesus, uh, I keep equating Jesus and God. They are the same, right? But, you know, go, you know G uh, Paul is asking God, take away this thorn. And God answers. And I think it's the same answer for you and me. Whatever it is that you're you know, focused on fully, asking God to take away from, maybe it's something that you need to just let go of and accept. I think that was the answer to Paul. So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I just, I'd like to read that to you. It says, so to keep me from becoming proud, he, he acknowledged in his mind this thorn in his flesh. Some think it might have been blindness himself. He's had issues with his eyes before. He says, this is Paul speaking, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. and My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. Imagine that. Paul was focused on his weakness. I want it to go away and the answer comes back. I want you to keep it. I want you to remain in it. Because in that you're going to discover the fact that even in weakness, even in the valley, even in the darkness, I'm sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you. 
So maybe part of the blindness is that you have is the fact that you don't like discomfort. You don't like imperfection in your life and you're so focused on trying to get everything lined up. But maybe the answer is you just have to get used to living in the chaos. And I think, you know, most people who have lots of children understand that, right? Uh, I remember when our, my kids were all little and I, I wanted a house that was nice and organized and, and uh, it was chaotic constantly. I had to come to terms with the fact that my house was never going to be neat again. I came to terms with the chaos so that I could focus on my walk with the Lord. Because I was going to go bananas, right? I was going to get mad at my wife. I was going to get mad at everything. I had to just kind of throw up my hands and go, you know what? It's my life now, and i got to live it. Maybe you're in that same circumstance where something's just not right. You'd like it to be right. You're so focused on it being right, and it's become a blindness to you. You've lost your joy in the Lord. So my encouragement, be healed. Heal yourself by saying, you know what? God has me going through this at this time, and I need to be okay with it. I think other uh, you know, things that keep us from seeing the Lord, excessive aspirations, right? Wanting lots of things. That's somehow at times how we get so busy. We want too much. We want to do too much. I want to do everything. If you could only see my house, it's strewn with all these began projects or ideas and all the equipment I need for them. I'm, and I get, that's one, one of my moments of blueness is where I, I just sit in my pile of incomplete projects and think I'm miserable. When do I get free from that? And I start thinking I want to buy a camp and I could move into the camp and leave all that stuff behind. Anyone ever think like that? Maybe it's just me. You're supposed to say amen. you got your own problems, and I know that. My problems, right, I try to do too much. Uh, I don't do the necessary work to clean up areas, right? I just move to another area to make it mad. And then all of a sudden I'm in a, you know, a, a mess all around me. And I begin to lose sight of why I'm here. I'm not here to get all those things done. I'm here to be a representative of God. Excessive aspirations, right? Jesus says in Matthew 6, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. What is it you love so much that you keep pursuing? And should you be pursuing it more than you pursue the Lord? Jesus says, the eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And the light you think you have is actually darkness. How deep that darkness is. Isn't that exactly what I'm talking about? Here it's saying you're blind. You have a treasure more than the treasure of the kingdom of heaven. You think you can see, but you're in darkness. You need to be healed so that you can follow me. And he says, verse 24, that Matthew 6, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You got to let go. Whatever it is that's consuming you, move past it, accept its presence, and focus on Christ. And that is healing, I think, for you to go through that mental exercise of, you know what? I'm going to just accept the chaos and rejoice in the Lord. A healed soul makes greater room for Christ in your life. And that healing sometimes comes in the form of priorities. I think uh, Matthew 6 goes on, talks about how, you know, the cure for anxiety, the New Living Translation calls, the heading for that section is the cure for anxiety. And I got my that got my attention. A cure for anxiety. And that's the one where he says, stop worrying about tomorrow. It's got enough problems of its own. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. And really, isn't he calling out to the blind person? Your eyes are closed to what really matters. Stop worrying. It says if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he certainly cares for you. Why do you have so little faith? Stop worrying. It's a form of blindness. And until you're healed from that, you're never going to see the Lord in the way that you could be. 
So in the darkness, listen for the Savior. That's the second point. I wanted to read Psalm 88, but I'm so long-winded. Why don't you just write down Psalm 88? It's, such a, it's the most depressing psalm. I read through it. And uh, man, he, talk about having a pity party and in the valley, you know, an example of someone who was experienced great hardship. But the beauty is, he says, oh Lord, I cry out to you. I keep on pleading day by day. Psalm 88 verse 13. So in the midst of the hardship, he hadn't lost hope. He regained his focus and was crying out to the Lord. The third point, I think, is uh, I see as we go on, right? The two blind men, Matthew 20, they cry out to Jesus. And they know who Jesus is and they've accepted it, right? They're trusting in Jesus as that promised redeemer. And we know that because the title that they shout out is Lord, Son of David. That's a messianic title. They're saying you're the Messiah, the anointed one, the one promised by God that brings hope to Israel. We acknowledge that. And I need hope. I need some help. And what does the crowd do? Yes, they're seeking Jesus. That's not what they say. Look at verse 31. What do they say? Here are these two blind men finding hope in Jesus Christ. And what does the crowd say? Shut up. Be quiet. And, you know, in the midst of that, just imagine how in discouraging that could be for the two blind men. First of all, they can't see. You know, by chance, they've come upon the Savior, and they're crying out to him. And instead of the crowd helping, they're saying, will you please shut up? We're trying to enjoy Jesus, and you're really getting in my way. And I think that happens today. I think a lot of the ailment in the church are people who are enjoying Jesus, but have lost sight of what Jesus is really for. So that third point on your scribe sheet, I I don't know, I think it makes sense. The third point in the scribe sheet is the fact, uh, don't let the misuse by others detract you from healing. Don't let the misuse of others detract you. And I thought maybe a real healing. Because there are people in the church. And they're here because they like being part of a church. They like what they get from it. But at the end of the day, it's not necessarily about healing and hope. And sometimes people, needy people, can become a burden to them. But my encouragement to you is don't let misuse by others detract you from real healing. And they didn't. You know, these two blind men, they didn't care what the crowd thought. And it says that they shouted uh, even louder, right? They only shouted louder. And what was it they shouted again? The one thing that they needed to make sure that Jesus understood, they understood who he was. Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. They were in need of mercy. They were in need of some relief. And they needed some help. And I don't know if you get to that point in your life where you, you get depressed and you get frustrated and you get tired, where you cry out to the Lord, Lord, have mercy on me. Please, I need to know your presence. I need to know you're there. I need to experience your healing. And I'll tell you, isn't that a good place to be? If you haven't had those moments, I feel bad for you. I'll pray that maybe some worse things happen to you. No, I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing, right, to think about. But being in the valley is when you discover the greatness of Christ. And if you've never been in a valley, I sure hope that maybe you find yourself there eventually so that you can experience the joy that it is to look up and say, wow, you know, even in the midst of all this stuff, I have hope in Jesus Christ. A healed soul makes greater room for Christ in your life. And when things are dark and you see a glimmer of light, you can't take your eyes off it, right? That's what hardship, that's what blindness can do, is it makes you start looking harder, listening. So those moments, I say, take advantage of them. Because, you know, we can't let the misuse by others detract us from what Christ is really seeking to do in our lives. We're not here to entertain ourselves. We're not here to make you leave feeling good every Sunday. We're here to be the followers of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and it's hard. I, uh, 
someone posted on Facebook, I think yesterday, just an interesting uh, talking about a uh, survey by George Barna, right? They do these surveys and he says, uh, what constitutes a biblical worldview? Christian researcher George Barna says it includes a belief in absolute moral truth as defined by scripture, as well as acceptance of six core biblical beliefs, the accuracy of biblical teaching, the sinless nature of Jesus, the literal existence of Satan, the omnipotence and omniscience of God, salvation by grace alone, and the personal responsibility to evangelize. So a biblical worldview has those six things necessary for you to really be defined as a Christian. And uh, I guess the survey, it said a recent survey of Protestant pastors conducted by the Barner Research, only half, 51%, passed the test on whether they possess a biblical worldview. Talk about blindness, right? Half of pastors, Protestant pastors, got a 51, you know, 51% of those pastors actually had a biblical worldview. Talk about the blind leading the blind. There are places where these six core elements of our belief, which all comes from the word of God, it's lost on them. They're doing something else. And just like that crowd that yells at these two blind men, shut up, we're enjoying Jesus. Today, still, there are crowds who are shutting out the gospel, who won't talk about sin because they're just enjoying Jesus. And what do we think about those people, right? Uh, Is that a good thing? Goes on to say, uh, it it went on to share some other. Um, things It says, of the pastors surveyed, Southern Baptists scored the highest with 71%. So 71% of Southern Baptists were Orthodox Christians. The United Methodists finished at the bottom with just 27%. In between were 57% of pastors of Baptist churches other than Southern Baptist. 51% of pastors of non-denominational Protestant churches, 51%. 44% of pastors of charismatic or Pentecostal churches, 35% of pastors of, uh, or excuse me, 28% of pastors of leading mainline denominations. And then finally, it said another point of interest in the survey dealt with education. Pastors least likely to have a biblical worldview were seminary graduates. People coming out of some seminary, apparently not a good seminary, a liberal seminary, uh, they were least likely to have a biblical worldview if they were seminary grads. That's, that's a scary thought. So needless to say, there are people who misuse uh, Jesus Christ. And I think this crowd is a good example of that, right? Uh, here are two blind people who could be healed by the Savior, and the crowd is saying, please be quiet. The fourth point, let me just keep moving on. It says to call, Jesus as, to call Jesus as Messiah gets his attention, right? I think the fact that they're calling out to Jesus as son of David, right? They understand the authority of Jesus Christ, and that draws the attention of Jesus. For you to call on Jesus Christ in the midst of your struggles and blindness gets God's attention, And then Jesus, it says, when he heard them, he stopped and called, what do you want me to do for you? Wouldn't that be nice if Jesus showed up and he looked at you and says, what can I do for you? (laughs) That'd be like the genie in the bottle, right? I don't know what you'd be wishing for. Hopefully you wouldn't be embarrassing yourself with some poor choice, right? I want to win the mega bucks. Jesus would probably just look at you and go, you know, go back and read this again. I think you're missing something there. But imagine that. He asks these two men, what is it that I can do for you? And, you know, I think these blind men were obviously the top thing on their list was they couldn't see. And you can't blame them for asking for that. I don't know if they were in a position of knowing fully what Christ was beginning to go do. I'm sure the state of their soul would have been at the top of their list, but at this point, they couldn't see that because they had a bigger issue. And once again, that's where we're at today. You have a bigger issue than focusing on Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you right now, it's not big enough. It shouldn't draw you away from him. 
And I think the same question is asked of us. What do you want me to do for you, right? And I think our answer needs to come back. I want to see. They said, Lord, I want to see. And the same thing in our hardship, in our dark valley, when Jesus says, what can I do for you? The answer is, I want to see. I want to see past this. I don't want to be bogged down and continue looking at the ground. Help me to look up. Help me to see your presence and your power and your grace, right? Think of Paul. My grace, God told him, my grace is sufficient for you. Help me to see your grace, Lord. And what is it uh, that, that Jesus says? Actually, I love the, what it says about Jesus. Verse 34, Jesus felt sorry for them. And he touched their eyes. Jesus felt sorry for them. They were pitiful. And I think uh, in our own ways, we can be pitiful too. Anyone want to, anyone ever feel pitiful? Groveling in your own, you know, uh, pitiful existence and whatever it is that you're going through. And I know these are real to you. These things are real to you and they feel real to you. But if you could see in light of eternity, if you could see your immortal body that once you're, you know, you're going to have one day in the presence of the Lord, don't you think those things would take on a different light? You would see differently. <clears throat> but Jesus has pity on these two blind men. And I think we need Christ's pity as well. That's the fifth point in your scribe sheet. We need God's pity because I am pitiful. Especially when I think about all the, you know, whatever it is that I'm complaining about. I gave you all my list. I bared my soul to you. And probably a lot of you are going, that's not a big deal. You have poor, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you need a bigger garage or something. That would take care of a lot of your problems. Or, you know, maybe you were just a little disorganized. Those aren't real problems, and I, I get that. Maybe you have not real problems that are consuming you. Maybe you have real, real problems, right? You, some of you are struggling with some serious things. But in the grand scheme of things, Christ wants to heal us. He wants to draw our attention back away from the temporal to the, you know, to the eternal. And that's the challenge we have, to draw away from the temporal to the eternal. There are temporary things that are consuming your thoughts, and it's time that you let him heal you so that you can make greater room for Christ in your life. And I think the, the outcome of this scripture is beautiful, right? The last thing is, uh, that last point in your scribe sheet, just so I don't miss, open eyes and healing take many forms. We kind of talked about, right? There's many ways to get distracted. But the end result is the right one. And it's the right one for us if we cry out to him for mercy. It says, then they followed him. What's the first thing you do when you get your vision? I'm going to follow the one who healed me. And that's the right response for you. If you've been healed by Jesus Christ, are you following him today? You should be. And I think that's the challenge we have sometimes is we act as if we don't know all that he is to us. Let me end with reading to you Ephesians chapter 4. That's on your scribe sheet. And that's the challenge for us, right? Stop living. Don't live any longer like the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused, right? Talk about blindness. Hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts, right? Here's that blindness. Closed minds, hardened hearts against him. And they have no sense of shame. They live for lustful, lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. They become selfish people. Help us not to be those people. Help us to see better and to be uh, greater followers of Christ. Let me pray for you this morning. Lord, uh, it's always uh, frustrating to recognize that we've uh, kind of wandered away from you once again, Lord. We've, we've let the momentary frustrations uh, or maybe the very dark realizations that uh, this life is temporary, we've allowed those things to consume our thoughts. And Lord, uh, our thoughts should be focused on you. Just as Paul said, I, I desire to capture every thought for Christ. We want to be the same, Lord. We don't want to lose sight. The fact that life is temporary, but uh, in you, it can be eternal. And that's where our joy resides. 
That's where our mind needs to be focused. So Lord, today maybe someone here needs healing. They need to see more clearly so that they can recognize that you're much, uh, a much greater focus of our attention, Lord. So we do pray. I pray for those people. Give them greater strength. Give them greater clarity, Lord. And help them to see. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.